Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Morgan. I'm Lyndon Chubin, Director of Education and Public Programs, and we are delighted to inaugurate a new annual lecture series with prize-winning author and educator Martin P Puckner, the Byron and uh, uh, Wien Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Harvard University. When we were researching possibilities for an opening address that can bring together the various curatorial areas of the Morgan, we could not have found a more appropriate speaker. As many of you know, the written word plays a central role at the Morgan, as told in our ancient Near Eastern seals and tablets, medieval and Renaissance manuscripts, literary and historical manuscripts, and printed books and bindings. Our collections comprise a unique and dynamic record of civilization, as well as an incomparable repository of ideas and of the creative process. Just yesterday, you might have heard about the Obamas forming a partnership with Netflix. And I quote, uh, that Barack and I have have always believed in the power of storytelling to inspire us, to make us think differently about the world around us, and to help us open our minds and hearts to others, Michelle Obama. Martin's recent and exhilarating book, The Written World, The Power of Stories to Shape People, History, Civilization, takes us on a journey through time and around the globe to reveal the powerful stories and literature, uh, the powerful stories and uh, literature that have played in creating the world we have today. And tonight's talk is also a perfect preview of a new exhibition, The Morgan Opens, uh, next Friday, and with the talk on Thursday night, The Magic of Handwriting, the Pedro Correo do Lago collection, featuring an extraordinary selection of letters, sketches, and manuscripts representing major figures in art, history, literature, and music, from Michelangelo and Puccini to Proust and Charlie Chaplin. Martin's writings include a dozen books and anthologies and over 60 articles and essays, and range from philosophy and theater to world literature and have been translated into many languages. Through his best-selling Norton Anthology, of world literature and his masterpieces of world literature, he has brought 4,000 years of literature to audiences around the globe. The Written World has been widely reviewed and is forthcoming in over a dozen languages. And his book will be available for purchase and signing directly following tonight's lecture in the auditorium lobby. In hundreds of lectures and workshops from the Arctic Circle to Brazil and from the Middle East to China, Martin Puckner has advocated for the arts and humanities in a changing world. At Harvard, he has instituted these ideas in a new program in theater, dance, and media, as well as in the Mellon School of Theater and Performance Research. Martin is just completing a year as a fellow at New York Public Libraries. Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers, where he has been working on a book about Rotwelsh, a secret language based on Yiddish, Hebrew, and German that has haunted his family for three generations. Please join me in welcoming Martin Puckner and the written world. Thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here and inaugurate this lecture series that is meant to celebrate the collection of the Morgan Library. Had I known, I think I could have very easily called my book not The Written World, but The World of the Morgan Library, because as Lyndon has just said, just walking through the, some of the exhibits uh, just now, I realized that that whole story is really here from the cuneiform tablets with which I will begin two, two recent, recent uh, printed books. So I want to give you a taste of this book, of this 4,000-year-long history of writing and literature. And as always, when you tell a story, it's good to start at the beginning, which for me, for us, must mean the beginning of writing. 
Now, writing was invented about 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, today it's Iraq, and it's always hard to pin down the origin of something. It's hard to find records, it's hard to reconstruct why something was invented for what purpose, and that's also true of the invention of writing. There's, of course, ar ar there are archaeological findings and, 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 and other indications, but for my purposes, the best way into understanding how writing was invented is a story, a story that is itsel itself over 4,000 years old, and it's a story through which Mesopotamian scribes, a written story through which Mesopotamian scribes imagined how their civilization had invented at an earlier time. The story takes place in the city of Uruk in Mesopotamia, and Uruk was really the first urban space in the history of humankind. Urbanism was made possible by a new form of intensive agriculture in the rich flood plains between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, and it allowed for an unprecedented number of humans, up to 50,000, to live together, closely together, in the first urban space. And this was the city of Uruk. And the story about the invention of writing features or revolves around the king of Uruk, who has his eyes set on the mountain realm of Arata. He wants, to, to, he wants this mountain realm of Arata to pledge allegiance to him, the rich king of Uruk. So what he does, he takes a messenger and he sends the messenger to the king of Arata, to the mountain realm of Arata, and he demands allegiance. The king of Arata is not very impressed by this demand and sends the messenger back with a challenge. The, the city of Uruk is very proud of, architect, of agriculture, as I just mentioned, and so the king of Arata says that if the king of Uruk manages to transport grain in nets and have it brought up to the mountains of Arata, maybe then he might pledge allegiance to the king of Uruk. So the king of uh, Uruk thinks about it, he takes grain, he lets it sprout, and at that point, he can put it into nets, he gives it to the messenger, the messenger runs back up into the mountain and has fulfilled the challenge. But the king of Arata still won't give in. He sends the messenger back with another challenge and then with a third challenge, and all the while the poor messenger has to run back and forth. And as things have reached this impasse, the, the king of Uruk gets really angry and he starts this long rant and the messenger standing next to him panics because he can't remember the long rant. And it's at this moment in the story that the king of Uruk takes clay, molds it into a tablet, puts his rant onto the tablet, gives the tablet to the messenger. The messenger has to run one more time up into the mountains. He shows the tablet to the king of Arata and says, here's the message. The king of Arata, of course, doesn't know writing. He looks at the tablet, doesn't see how it could contain a message. And it's at this moment, according to the story, that he pledges allegiance to Uruk. So there are two things about the story, about the invention of writing, that are interesting for our purposes. The first is that it's clearly a kind of self-serving story. Here's a story that, that, that scribes tell about their ancestors, about the invention of this technology over which they preside, and it's clearly a story that showcases the power of the written word, because the king of Uruk had been you know, threatening the king of Arata with invasion and had met all these challenges, and to no avail, it was only the written word, this technology, that, that brought the king of Arata into submission. The other thing about that story that's interesting for me is that it has absolutely nothing to do with literature. The story ha has only to do with power, with the ability of one city, the city of Uruk, to project its power deep into the hinterland with a technology like this, a cuneiform letter with a cuneiform envelope. This allows scribes, like the scribes who told the story, to project the power of the city into the hinterland to create the first territorial empire. And this is, in fact, the use to which the earliest forms of writing were put. Writing was really invented by accountants who used it to record economic transactions, to create the first bureaucracy, state bureaucracies, 
and to send diplomatic and political messages like the one in the story uh, about the invention of writing in Uruk. So for several hundreds of years, that's how writing was used. But at some point, one of these accountants, one of these imperial scribes who used messages like that to control the first territorial empire used this technology of putting words onto clay for a completely different purpose, and that was to tell and to write down a story. This is a clay tablet that contains the story of the flood from the epic of Gilgamesh. It's only about this big, and the entire epic of Gilgamesh fits on 13 clay tablets. There are a couple of clay tablets of that size and that density of information in the, in the exhibition upstairs. You can look at it. It's amazing to see how much information fits on these small tablets. And this tablet and the 12 others that contain the Epic of Gilgamesh is the first great product of that decision by one scribe to use an accounting technique called writing to write down a story. Now, stories had, of course, been told orally and transmitted orally wherever humans have lived, usually by specialized bards or singers or storytellers who would tell these stories on important occasions. But in Mesopotamia, um, the important thing that happened was the intersection of this tradition of oral storytelling with writing technology. And that, for me, is the true origin of the written world, this origin of literature as we know it, the origin of storytelling with writing technology. And that definition of literature, storytelling and writing technologies, also means that if you change one part of this definition, namely writing technologies, you will change the other part, namely the kinds of stories that are being told, what stories are told by whom and for what purpose. So this becomes sort of the red thread, the through line of the story of literature and writing that, that I'm telling. It's a story that is in part driven by new technologies and how they influence storytelling. So we have here the epic of Gilgamesh, and it is perfect for my purposes because it is an epic set in Uruk, the, the place in which, according to the story about the invention of writing, writing was invented. It celebrates. King Gilgamesh as, the, as a king of Uruk who rebuilds the city walls and rebuilds the city and leads it to new glory. And the way it presents the city was as a great human achievement, and in particular achievement made out of clay. The powerful city walls of Uruk are made out of clay bricks. The buildings are made out of clay. The vessels through which the agricultural products from the hinterland are brought into the cities are made of clay. they are even clay sickles and clay piping. And so the entire civilization that's presented here is really a marvel made of clay. And the epic begins by giving us a, almost like a tour of Uruk, and, and we, we look at these different clay marbles. And the, the opening of the epic of Gilgamesh even mentions the clay pits from which uh, the clay that's used to build the city is harvested. But of course, the most important use of this marvelous material clay that the epic celebrates is the one I've been talking about, that it serves as the uh, writing surface for the first full developed writing system, cuneiform, the incisions made into clay tablets. And that's very important to the epic of Gilgamesh that it presents itself as being written, as a written text, and King Gilgamesh as a writer king. This is very much in contrast to other early epics, which almost always present themselves, even when they're, once they reach written form, as something that, that, that is being sung. For example, the much later uh, Homeric epics, they present themselves as being sung by a muse, inspired by a muse, a singer sings, of, 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 the, of, of the Iliad and sings of the Odyssey. In the Odyssey, some of the adventures of Odysseus are even sung by Odysseus himself at the court of the Phaeacians. And in fact, there is absolutely no writing in the, in, in the Bronze Age world depicted by the Homeric epics, with one very small 
um, exception. This is very much in, contract, in contrast to what, what we're dealing with here, a much earlier epic that is clearly proud of writing as one of the great achievements of Mesopotamian civilization and therefore presents itself as having been written down by King Gilgamesh himself. So this is, if you will, the first chapter in the story of literature uh, I'm telling. More and more parts of the world develop writing, and sooner or later that intersection of oral storytelling and writing happens, and the result are epics like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Homeric epics or the other epics that, that, that stem from the ancient world. I now want to go on to the second chapter in the story of literature. It's a kind of new version of these early epics. I call them foundational texts because they all become important reference points for entire cultures. Fragments of the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, have been found all over uh, the, the, the Near East. So you really get a sense of the kind of reach of these early, uh, uh, these early epics. And the same is true of the Homeric epics and other epics. But the second chapter, uh, I, I, I present that through a scene that does not take place in Uruk. Uh, it takes place in another city that's not too far from a global perspective, a scene that takes place in Jerusalem, and it revolves around a scribe, another scribe who has learned, has been inducted into the Babylonian writing sculpture, namely the scribe Ezra. Ezra grew up in Mesopotamian, in Babylonian exile. The city of Jerusalem had been destroyed, and most inhabitants had been forced into Babylonian exile. And that's important for my story because it was in Babylon that Ezra and his fellow exiles were exposed to the most sophisticated writing culture of their time. And Ezra himself became a Babylonian scribe. It's also true that in exile, the scriptures of the Jews had become more important because here was a, a people that had no longer had power, that had no longer had a king. They were in exile, so they were separated from the temple. Um, so the, the texts were all they had, and these texts became increasingly important, and increasingly important also because of the great writing culture of Babylon. So the scribe Ezra, here depicted, by the way, by medieval monks, the scribe Ezra assembles a group of exiles around him and gains permission to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city wall and to rebuild the temple in order to reinstitute Judaism as a temple practice. And this they proceed to do with great difficulty. They, they, they return home. They are shocked by the state in which the city is. Almost no one lives there. It's in ruin. The, the walls are uh, uh, in ruins. It needs to be entirely rebuilt. And this, the fellow exiles and, and Ezra proceed to do. But then, Ezra does something else, something that's important for my story. He plans the scene very carefully. He builds a wooden stage, much like the one I'm standing on right now. He gathers all the people around him, and he enters the stage from behind. And what he, he bear, comes bearing the scrolls onto which he had been writing the stories of the Jews, and he holds them up and he demands that the people bow before those scrolls as if they were a god. And for me, this is a moment when an idea, a new idea, the idea of sacred scripture is born. Now, writing had been used before to tell stories about gods and humans, so it always had some connection to what we would call religion. But at this moment, when Ezra demanded that people bow before these scrolls as if they were themselves a deity. The idea that's too very familiar to us was born, namely the idea that writing itself, the text itself, could be sacred. That some of these stories that had been written down by scribes could have divine status. 
And it's a very familiar story, to, uh, fact to us, the idea of scripture, but especially if you remember that writing was originally created by accountants, by imperial accountants who sent messages between Uruk and Arata, the idea that, that, that this accounting technology would become sacred seems maybe a little bit more surprising and like all ideas that it had to be invented at a particular place. And it was invented there and in a couple of other places. And it's such an important idea because it took hold and it spread to the extent that I think today we still very much live in a world created by Ezra and others in other cultures who declared some scriptures sacred. Because I think today we can't even think what a religion would be without some sort of sacred text behind it. I think our concept, our modern concept, that is co the modern concept for the last 3,000 years of religion is very much bound up in the idea of sacred scripture. Um, and how to deal with that, I think, is an important task for our time, as it has been for the last 3,000 years. So an important idea that is sort of a particular twist on these early foundational texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Homeric Epics that some of these stories now have acquired, have acquired the status of divinity. So this, if you will, is the second stage, the second chapter in the story of literature. And now I want to go on to a third chapter, one that I don't want to illustrate just with one scene, but with several scenes, because that third chapter is a real pattern that happens in different cultures, more or less at the same time, within a few hundred years of each other in the ancient world. And the story, the scene I'm asking you to imagine revolves not around a text, but around a teacher. A teacher who invents new forms of speaking, new, a new sound, and a new way of interacting with his, in this phase of uh, literature, they're all men. This will change later on. With his followers and students. And people realize that there's a new form of preaching and speaking and living that's associated with these teachers, these charismatic teachers. So people leave their, their lives behind. They start to follow these teachers, these teachers around, and, and are incredibly devoted to them. And it is all based on that live, interactive teacher. Now, as I said, this is an interesting pattern because these teachers emerge in some of the most advanced writing cultures of the ancient world. In India, the name of a teacher is called the Buddha. And you see Buddha here depicted from a Tibetan uh, uh, illustration in the company of his uh, followers. In China, his name is Master Kong, whom we know by the Latin name of Confucius. In Greece, his name is Socrates. And in the Middle East, his name is Jesus. Now, four very different cultures, but a similar phenomenon. And these four teachers, and later there will be another teacher by the name of Muhammad and others following him, following the same pattern. These teachers, this is why I mentioned, I talked of them as a pattern, have many things in common. But for us, the most important thing they have in common is that none of them wrote a single word. Instead, they insisted on precisely this kind of live, interactive question and answer, the live teaching that, that, that these charismatic teachers throve on and that made their st the students and followers flock to them and follow them, leaving everything behind. That was the power of these charismatic teachers. They could have written, because with the possible exception of India, they lived in the most advanced writing cultures of their time. So choosing not to write was a deliberate choice. Among those four, it is Socrates who developed the most elaborate explanation of why he refused to use this newfangled technology of writing. He had a couple of arguments against writing. They all have to do with worries about miscommunication, what we would now call fake news, 
with the fact that if once you write words down, it's very easy to take them out of context and manipulate them in various ways. He also worried that you couldn't ask a written text ever follow-up questions to clarify something. So again, there's room, huge room for misunderstanding. He also worried that once we started to trust writing, and he described it almost as a kind of external memory device, we ourselves would no longer have to know things ourselves, and that our memories would atrophy and we would become dumber through this technology. So these were some of his arguments. There were others, more abstract philosophical arguments against writing, but those three are perhaps the most powerful. And, and perhaps we can extrapolate from these arguments that, that these other charismatic teachers who likewise could have written but refused to write, likewise chose, made that choice for similar reasons. So this is how they lived. This is how they became successful teachers and preachers. And sooner or later, the inevitable, inevitable happened, and these teachers died. In some of them, in the case of the Buddha and Confucius, they died of natural causes. In the case of Socrates and Jesus, they die of a violent death. But no matter how they die, their students are now faced with a very interesting dilemma, namely how to remember their teacher's words. They start traditions of oral memory, often coming up with a very elaborate division of labor so that some followers would remember certain speeches and scenes and others, others. And so this works for a while, but sooner or later, almost again inevitably, the temptation is too great. And the students of all four of these followers will do exactly what their teachers deliberately chose not to do, namely use writing in order to write down their teacher's words. Now, it might be tempting to describe that as a kind of betrayal. After all, their teachers had told them, their students, not to write. And, and as a teacher myself, I, I know that students often don't listen when you tell them not to do something. But I actually don't want to describe it as a betrayal because, of course, first of all, we have to be all very grateful to these students without their betrayal, without their decision to use writing to memorize their teachers and their preachings. We wouldn't know about these teachings. And B, what's interesting to me about what these students did is that I think they were very canny. They knew exactly what they were doing. By which I mean, they of course knew that their teachers didn't write and had good reasons, especially in the case of Socrates, had articulated these reasons very, very carefully why writing was bad. So what these, what these students did is that they were cognizant of this refusal to use writing and they channeled, in a sense, that refusal back into the kinds of texts they produced. By which I mean, that these students produced texts that were very different from the old texts produced by scribes, such as the Mesopotamian scribes I talked about, or the kinds of texts produced by Ezra, the scribe, dense texts that were supposed to be read by other scribes that are often had complicated layers and layers of text because they are all based on long oral traditions. The texts produced by, these, by the students of, of, of the Buddha and Confucius and, and Jesus and Socrates are very different in character. They're much more vivid, they're dialogic, they revolve around anecdotes, they show these teachers in live interaction with their students and followers, they are dramatic. In other words, I think they, these students knew how to infuse these writings with something of this kind of live, performative, oral speech on which they, on which the power of these charismatic teachers had presided. So out of this complicated interaction of, of teachers refusing to write and students refusing to listen to their teachers, a new kind of text is born, namely the texts of these that we now associate with these four master teachers, as they're called in China, and, and others like them, a new kind of text dialogic, anecdotal, and dramatic. Plato 
the student of Socrates who wrote down his words, it pushed this perhaps in the most dramatic dimension by writing the Socratic words down as dialogues with invented characters. And some of these dialogues were even performed, though not in the large open era, area uh, theaters of, of Greece. So new kinds of texts uh, based on these four master teachers. And it's an incredibly important group or class of texts, because these texts are at the origins of some of the most important religions and intellectual traditions. Buddhism, uh, Chinese philosophy, uh, Greek, i.e. Western philosophy, uh, and Christianity. Now, I started by saying that the story I'm telling has to do with the intersection of storytelling and writing technologies. So I want to focus a little bit on some of these technologies that changed the written word, that changed the way storytelling happened, what kinds of stories were, were told, and how, how they acquired readers and followers. And I want to do this, uh, I want to illustrate this with one of the texts written by students of one of these master teachers, in this case, students of the Buddha, who wrote down a Buddhist sutra called the Diamond Sutra. And once it was written, it was able to travel, and it traveled to China, where it was translated into Chinese, and where, where it encountered two of the most important revolutions in writing technology. This is an image of the opening of the Diamond Sutra, and it is the earliest surviving printed texts in the world from 868, so many hundreds of years before Gutenberg will reinvent print in Northern Europe. So print is one technology that the Diamond Sutra encountered in China, and the other is paper. This is a Diamond Sutra printed on paper. These two technologies are crucial because they drop the price of literature. And that means that they lower the barrier for entry into the written world. And as we all know, if you drop the price of something, really interesting things start to happen. Above all, two things happen. The first is what we see here. Often the early adopters of new writing technologies are sacred or canonical texts. They are often in the best position to avail themselves of new technologies. They're also texts that have the most invested in new technologies. And this was particularly the case with Buddhism. Buddhism was a proselytizing movement. It wanted to win over followers. And that's why these printed and written sutras promised its readers rewards if they were going to teach these sutras and if they were going to replicate the sutras and copy them. So there's a huge investment in replicating and making these sutras widely available. So it makes sense that these Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhist monks would be among the first to systematically use paper and print because it allowed them precisely to attract followers and to get rewards uh, um, for, for doing so. And it's interesting that this is a pattern that will repeat itself with other writing technologies or what happens when these technologies enter other cultures, most famously um, when Gutenberg, several hundreds of years later, uh, uh, um, reinvents print. And as you know, and if you don't, you can go and look at it here at Morgan Library, uh, one of the first texts he prints is another sacred text, namely the the, uh, the Latin Bible. So this is what happens, that the, the most established, sacred, most valued texts become early adopters of new technologies. But another thing happens at the same time, and that is an explosion of popular writing. This is what happens when you drop the price of something. It means that there are suddenly new people who gain entrance to writing, and that means new stories are being told for new readers. And I want to illustrate that with, in a place that um, 
that uh, with the Arabic world that uh, acquires, that's the next cultural area that acquires the, um, the, the secret of papermaking. Their dramatic story about how the Arabic world extracted the secret of papermaking from China. There are stories of, of a great war and Chinese prisoners of war who get tortured, and that's how the Arabs manage to, to torture the secret of papermaking out of them. There's, there's no reason to believe that that's actually how it happens, but I think the story captures something, namely how important the art of papermaking was seen, how valuable a technology it was seen to be. And that's exactly what proved to be the case in the Arabic world. Baghdad became the center of papermaking, and the Arabs improved on Chinese papermaking, especially by introducing the art of making paper out of rags, which made it much more geographically independent from the certain, from, for example, the mulberry tree that had been mostly used in China for papermaking. So Baghdad becomes the center of papermaking, and paper is really the technology that powers what we now call the uh, golden age of Arab letters. Here's a page from a, from a beautiful calligraphic Quran, and I show this because, again, it is a sacred text uh, written by the followers of Muhammad, Muhammad, like Socrates and the Buddha and, 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 and these other master teachers, didn't write a single word. There are debates about whether he was literate or not, but his followers wrote down the Quran and they used paper once it was introduced into the Arabic world to great effect. But that's one side of this equation. The other side, as I mentioned, is an explosion of popular storytelling. And the best text to emerge from that, the greatest text, I think, to emerge from that is the Thousand and One Nights. The earliest existing version of that story collection is a paper fragment from, from, from Cairo. And, and, and it shows that suddenly now, now that the price of writing has dropped, new kinds of storytelling, including popular storytelling, make it into writing. The stories that are collected in the Arabian Nights come from all over the place, some of, as far as India and Persia and Greece. There's, there's a real network of storytelling, of stories circulating around the Silk Road and other trade networks. But these stories are now collected and framed with the wonderful framing story of Shahrazad and the mad king who had discovered his wife's infidelity and had become deranged swearing that he would kill any woman after spending only one night with her. Shahrazad, um, oops, Shahrazad, as we know, gave herself to the king, but she had this plan to start to tell stories, and so she starts to tell stories, and the king wants to uh, hear the end of the story, and this is how Shahrazad uh, stays alive, taking the king from cliffhanger to cliffhanger. This is the great storytelling machine, the great storytelling frame that, that really ups the ante on, on storytelling. But it, it does something else, uh, because by the end of the Thousand and One Nights, not only is Sher Assad still alive, the king, the mad king, is cured. Because many of the stories revolve around kingship, many revolve around infidelity, and so step by step, Sher Assad manages to tell stories that allow the king to see his own experience in a different light and cure him. And I think that's important because these new popular form of storytelling were as first devalued. And even today in, in the Arabic world, the Thousand and One Nights are seen with a certain amount of suspicion. And the Quran is always held up as the great uh, writing achievement of that civilization. So it's important for Shehar Assad to show that even these kind of popular stories have a pedagogical, educational, or in this case even one could say therapeutic uh, purpose. And this is exactly what the frame story of the Arabian Nights shows us to be the case.
Now, we've been kind of following what I might call the paper trail from China to the Arabic world. And it is, in fact, through the Arabic world, and in particular through Arab-occupied Europe, Arab-occupied Spain, Al-Andalus, that the art of paper making finally makes it into Europe. And it makes it into Europe just in time for the reinvention of print by Johannes Gutenberg. Now, what's interesting about it, and what's interesting about paper in the Arabic world, that everything I've, I've been describing uh, about the Arabic world, the golden age of Arabic letters, the, the wonderful calligraphic Quran, and the Arabian Nights, are, is all due only to paper, and not to the other great Chinese invention that in China had gone hand in hand with paper, namely print. The Arabs were uninterested in print. There was no printing in, in, in the Arabic world. So it's almost like a test case for the effects of paper without print. And we, we can see how transformative and profound they were. So paper comes into Europe through, the, through Spain and Al-Andalus. And print somehow makes it into, onto Gutenberg's radar screen through an indirect route that's impossible to reconstruct. But we know that Gutenberg knew something about Chinese print, not just in with wood blocks. The, the Diamond Sutra I showed you was printed with wood blocks. But there were also, there's also Chinese printing and later <laughs> Korean printing with movable type. So what Gutenberg does is not invent print. He reinvents it and he perfects it. He basically takes apart the whole complicated process of print and he turns it into what I would describe as one of the first industrial sort of division of labor, assembly line style production processes. He also introduces new techniques. Living in a wine country in, in mine, he uses something that's ubiquitous, ubiquitous all around him, namely a wine press for the purposes of pressing paper onto, uh, um, onto, onto type, something that hadn't happened in China. So he perfects it and turns print into a vehicle for mass producing books. And as I mentioned, this is a page from the Gutenberg Bible that you can also see one of the originals in the Morgan Library. Again, an established, as I mentioned, canonical text becomes an early adopter of print. And this is, in hindsight, we can say the irony. Because for about 70 years, the church and print are a match made in heaven. The church loves print and becomes Gutenberg's first client. Because here's a way to mass produce Bibles that are more beautiful and above all, much more error free than any of the hand copied Bibles that devoted monks had produced for hundreds of years. The church had gotten really worried about that, that generations of scribal errors meant that mass wasn't, wasn't celebrated in the exact same way in two churches, in any of the churches, because there were errors, sometimes egregious errors, that were copied and copied and copied. So here was a, a promise by Gutenberg that the church could, of course, there might be printer errors, but they would be more easily uh, corrected, and they wouldn't be passed on through generations of scribal copying practice. So the church loved print. Loved print because of the Bible. It loved print even more because of another thing that Gutenberg offered the church to print en masse, and that was indulgences. It was perfect, because an indulgence, an indulgence is just one page in Latin promising relief of sins. You leave the name of the person who buys the, the, the indulgence free. You can just fill that in. And then you can print hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of copies of a single indulgence were produced. And it was perfect. It was like printing money. So, for 70 years, Bibles, indulgences, but as we know, uh, this marriage between the church and print didn't last, 
It didn't last, I would say, because of that second um, effect of writing technologies, namely an explosion of popular writing. The friar Martin Luther, of course, got incensed by this flood of indulgences that were uh, all over the place, and he started to protest. He didn't know anything about print, so the way he protest, protested, the way he wrote his 95 theses was with, by hand, in church Latin, not something intended for a mass audience. He sent the letter to his bishop, the bishop ignored it, and then some of Martin Luther's friends thought that they might take that letter to the printer, and this is what they did, and then they translated it into the language of the people, in this case, German, and the rest is history. It turns out that Martin Luther had a real knack for polemical writing, and he used the printing press against the church in, the, in a way that no one had predicted, and he started to dominate the world of print. For the, for the first couple of decades of his production, uh, uh, more than one-third of all printed matter in Germany was written by Martin Luther. So this popular explosion, the second effect of writing technologies that I've seen in China, in, in the Middle East, and now in Europe, set in, and it showed just how transformative um, new writing technologies can be. I should uh, slowly come to an end and take the story to the present, because as, as, you, as you can probably tell, or imagine that this emphasis on technologies, on writing technologies in the story of literature is of course in part uh, one I chose because of the experience we all going through. We are going through the, one of these rare moments when new technologies are changing the way we communicate with written words, when, which as we all notice means that there are huge changes in how we communicate in news, in stories, in storytelling, and how printed matter circulates, or in this case, electronically circulates. Who, who writes and who reads? They're the first Twitter poets that are becoming celebrities. So it's clear that there's something very important that's happening all around us. And in a way, what I try to do in the book is look at the prehistory of that, look at the prehistory of what we are experiencing, and to see what kind of patterns one might detect in that 4,000-year-long history. And, and the pattern, I would say, is precisely this, this combination of early adopter uh, established canonical texts like the Diamond Sutra or the Quran or the Latin Bible and the explosion of popular writing that, that's like the Arabian Nights or, in the case of Gutenberg, Martin Luther's polemics and later forms like the novel that start to dominate the written world that we all know so well today and that we are living at the end of. So um, I, I begin the book in a sense where the story ends by saying that even though technologies change, some of the most important foundational stories um, that come from the first or the second a phase of the story of literature are still with us. You probably all know this image. It's from Apollo 8. It was taken by Bill Anders, uh, one of the three astronauts on board Apollo 8 in 1968. And I open the story of uh, writing with uh, this scene for two reasons. The astronauts aboard Apollo 8 were the first to leave terrestrial orbit and make it all the way to the moon. They didn't land on the moon. They didn't have a landing vehicle on board. They were going to orbit the moon and then they to return to Earth. And this is what they did. So they made it out. They orbited the moon. And whenever they would be on the far side of the moon, they would be out of radio contact for about 50 minutes, and there's always a lot of nail biting about whether they would reappear, uh, uh, and so a very, very dramatic moment towards the end of 1968. And the crew fell behind schedule. There were all kinds of small crises that they had to deal with. But nevertheless, when they reappeared from the far side of the moon and reestablished 
uh, radio contact, the three astronauts said that they had a message for Earth. This was Christmas 1968. They had prepared this message very carefully. They had typed it on a fireproof piece of paper that was, of course, floating in space. And they had rehearsed it, and, 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 and this was the message, and they had carefully staged it, and this message was the most watched human event at that point in the history of the world. And the message began, and God created the heaven and the earth, and it became clear that the message the three astronauts aboard Apollo 8 were delivering from space was the opening of Genesis, a text from the first stage of literature. And for me, it's an important moment. It shows the importance of technology, of course, but it also shows the importance of old stories. Because somehow, for reasons that no one could have predicted, this story of the creation of the Earth turned out to be perfect for being read from space at a distance, in part because the creation here is not presented as it is in another part of Genesis and in many other creation myths as uh, a world that's being molded from clay and God, the God that creates uh, uh, earth and humans as a kind of art artisan who is getting his hands dirty. But not so in the opening of Genesis where, where, where the world is created just through words. So um, an important reminder of the importance of these stories and how they adapt to new technologies and how they can become newly relevant in completely unexpected ways. And this is why I think we are living through an exciting moment in the history of writing. Yes, a lot is changing, and there's a lot of anxiety about that, about new communication technologies, and I, I share them. But when I look at the prehistory of what we're living through the last 4,000 years, I think that it is going to be very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't be shy. Raise your hand and I'll call on you and I will repeat the question since we are recording tonight's lecture. Any comments? Yes, uh-huh. So glad uh, to ask. So I'll, I will just re oh. I'll repeat this. This is a question about the development of writing in the Americas. I'm, I'm so glad to ask because it's for me one of the most fascinating episodes uh, and to, to which I devote a chapter in the book because all the early writing cultures I mentioned in, 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 in Egypt, in, 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 in Greece, in Mesopotamia, China, they all happened on the Eurasian continent. And so it's possible that writing really, well, the, the idea of writing was really invention, uh, invented only once and then spread via ideas transfer to as far as China and Egypt and so on and so forth. The writing systems themselves are very different, but it's possible since all of these cultures were in indirect contact on the Eurasian continent that writing there was only invented once. But we know that humans invented writing at least twice because of the Americas, in particular the Mayans. The Mayans, were, there's no contact between the Americas and Eurasia in a couple of thousand years uh, in between. So we know Mayans invented their own writing form and invented their own, and, and from that invention of writing uh, emerged another completely independent history of writing and literatures until the, until contact, until Columbus. So it's almost, it's, it's like a, a control experiment, again, where you can see what happens. Would, will the same pattern uh, emerge that, that we, we, we can detect in Europe? And I feel like uh, scholars or historians of writing are, have, have not fully understood the importance of, of, of the second tradition, in part because many of the Mayan texts have only been deciphered in the last uh, 50, 60 years. So it, it's fascinating, and, and the short answer is a similar pattern. There's a, there's a class of scribes that emerges. There's an intersection of storytelling with these writing technologies. Uh, foundational texts emerge, and in this case, the one I write about the most interesting is the Popol Vuh, 
Um, and so that means that when Columbus arrives, he is encountering in the Mayans the only civilization in the Americas that has a full writing uh, culture. And the result of that is something that I describe as the battle of the books. The Spaniards come, writing has just been reinvented by Gutenberg. So they arrive in the new world with their newly printed Bibles. And those newly printed Bibles, in a sense, collide with these wonderful handcrafted Mayan uh, codices. Um, and uh, it is a real clash because very quickly the Spaniards realize that Mayan culture is really bound up in these books, so they are trying to eradicate them and to burn them. And they manage to burn almost all of them. And there are three anonymous scribes, Mayan scribes, who realize what is going on, and they make two incredibly important decisions. The first is to go underground, because they realize that their writing culture is being wiped out and that there's no way to stop it. So they go underground to preserve the Popol Vuh, their great sacred text an epic, and it's a wonderful epic. But they make a second decision. They realize that their writing system is being wiped out, so that if they want to be read in the future, what they have to do is write down, preserve this epic in the writing system of the victors, namely the Latin alphabet. And that's exactly what they did, and that's how the Popol Vuh survived. Great. Uh huh. Yes? Right. Okay. Yeah. The the uh, question is, what's the history of incorporating images uh, with uh, text and with writing? It's 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 a great question, and many of the texts that I showed had images, uh, um, and the the idea of the image and, and of writing are really bound up with each other in important ways. Of course, especially before the invention of the alphabet, to which I also devote a lot of attention, a really important and transformative moment that takes over most, but not all, of the world, East Asia being an important exception here. Um, so early writing is itself imagistic, especially hieroglyphics, the Mayan glyphs uh, that I just mentioned, uh, the, the Mesopotamian cuneiforms, once they emerge full-fledged, are somewhat less uh, 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 image-based, but there are still traces there. Uh, once the alphabet takes over, the image is exiled from writing, but it nevertheless reappears all across uh, uh, these new technologies. So the, the way I would describe it is that each new technology, including paper and print, both in China and when it gets reinvented by Gutenberg, reconfigure the relationship between image and text. Cuneiform is, I mentioned how these entire cities were built out of clay, and that was perfect because that was also the writing surface. So you could have cuneiform writing across these reliefs, and that's exactly, if you go to the map, you can, you, can, you can see that, so writing across images. But that's just one example. The, uh, uh, the, the Diamond Sutra I showed you also had an image of the Buddha surrounded by his students, and that was also part of the, um, of, of the print. So, so the image, I think you're absolutely right, the image and writing are really bound up with each other in complicated ways, and these new technologies reconfigure that relationship. It's very difficult, especially in early print, to include images and how to technically do that, and of course, how to conceptually do that, and what role the image plays with respect to writing. So a, huge, uh, uh, a hugely interesting history there. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, yes, we'll, we'll have one more. Uh-huh, yes? The, the uh, question about uh, modicums and emojis and, and, and how yeah. have we come full circle? We, you know, we have, and in, in, in other ways uh, as well. I mean, you know, I started with tablets. Tablets were replaced by two formats that were much more convenient. First, the scroll, which Ezra held up. And then by the codex, the Roman codex, I didn't have time to do that, that really re more or less replaced the scroll, because books, what the Romans, a Roman invention, the codex, uh, because it's so easy to flip through to store, the Morgan Library is a great temple. 
to the form of the codex. But today, of course, as we all know, tablets are back. And I have images in the book with, with Egyptian and Mesopotamian scribes sitting cross-legged with a tablet on their lap. And if I squint, they look exactly like my students who are sitting on the floor of the library, cross-legged with their tablets on their lap. And the other thing that's also come full circle is scrolling. So as I just mentioned, you know, the, the scroll, continuous text, was replaced more or less entirely by the codex, discrete pages bound. Um, the Mayans, by the way, invented their own form of codex, but accordion style. So they came up with this related, but interestingly different form. Um, but now we are scrolling again because computers and code text is continuous uh, code, not they can, of course, simulate pages, but they don't nat naturally gravitate to it. So when I look at what, what's happening today with image and text, um, with emojis, with scrolling, with tablets, uh, it's interesting that for all the, and I do think these are transformative changes in, in, in the written world, and we, we are only at the beginning. In the past, these older technologies, it often took hundreds of years for a true new formats and new forms of storytelling driven by these technologies to establish themselves. So I think none of us will really live to see the full extent of these effects. But we are already seeing some of these effects. But not everything is new. And it's fascinating to me, precisely as you say, that there are quite a few things from emojis to scrolling and to tablets that seem to return us to the very origin of the written world. Well, thank you very, very much, Martin, for a fascinating talk. Thank you. And uh, best of luck on your research and teaching up, up in Cambridge. Uh, and please, please join us for book signing and uh, outside in the auditorium, and Martin can answer more of your questions. Thanks very much. We hope to see you again. Thank you very much.